Welcome back. We need to continue our study now on uh, the symbolism that is used in the Bible. How do we interpret symbols correctly? And as we ended our last, last session, we were talking about the fact that symbols are liquid or symbols are fluid, which means that they take different shapes depending on the context in which they appear. And so I want to give uh, several examples here that we have in our syllabus. First of all, when we talk about a lion, a lion is a symbolic, um, be a symbolic animal that is used in Bible prophecy. So what does a lion represent in Bible prophecy? Can it represent Christ? Yes, yes he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Can it represent the devil? Yes. Yeah, he goes as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Can it represent Judah, the son of Jacob? Yeah. Uh, can it represent Babylon? Yeah, in Daniel chapter 7 it represents Babylon. So, so when you find lion in a, a prophetic context, don't just assume it always means the same thing. It can mean different things in different contexts. Uh, let's uh, take the symbol of wine. Is wine uh, a symbol that always means the same thing? No. Of course not. Wine can represent the blood of Christ, right? Yes. Yeah. He says, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. And he was, uh, was talking about the grape juice. Uh, can wine also represent uh, the blood of the wicked? Yes. Yeah, of course. Can wine also represent doctrine? You don't put new wine in old lambskins. Remember what Jesus said? He's saying, you don't put my, new, my fresh new teachings in the old traditions of the scribes and Pharisees, is what he was saying. So, so wine, and by the way, wine can also represent false doctrine. If it's fermented wine, because the harlot gives her wine to the kings of the earth, right? And so when you find wine, don't just assume that wine always means the same thing. Because symbols can be flexible. They can, they can mean different things in different contexts. What does a star represent? Can a star represent Christ? Yes. yes. He's the bright and morning star. Revelation 22 verse 16. Can a star represent Satan? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's Lucifer. The morning star. Uh, can it represent ministers? Yes. Revelation 1 verse 20. The seven stars in the hand of Jesus represent the, the ministers to the seven churches. Can stars represent God's people? Stars can represent God's people. It says in Daniel chapter 12 that God's people will shine as stars throughout eternity. And so when you find a star or stars in the Bible, don't just assume that stars always mean the same thing. They, it can mean different things in different contexts. Now, what does leaven represent? You know, always when I ask that question, the first answer that comes is that leaven represents sin. And that's true. You have verses here in parentheses, Exodus 12, 15, Leviticus 2, 11, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. There are many texts that say that leaven represents sin, but not always. Because according to the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 13 and verse 33, uh, leaven can be a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You put leaven in the dough, and what happens with the dough? It grows. And the lump represents the church. So the Holy Spirit is in the church, and what happens with the church? It grows. So just because you find leaven, don't think that it represents sin all the time. It can be a flexible symbol, and you have to take into account the context. How about the king of the north? Is God the king of the north? Yes, he is. Where is his throne? In the sides of the north according to Isaiah 14. Uh, let me ask you, can the king of the north also be a symbol of a counterfeit king of the north? Yes. Oh yeah, in Daniel chapter 11. So don't just assume that because king of the north is used, it always refers to God. It can also refer to someone who wants to occupy the position of God. And by the way, the devil also wanted to occupy the place of God in the side of, sides of the north. Uh, what about a he-goat? Can a he-goat represent Christ? Yeah, how many goats were chosen on the Day of Atonement? How many he-goats? Two. One of them represented whom? 
Christ, and the other one represented Satan. And incidentally, he goats can also represent prominent rulers in other contexts, political rulers, and so it can mean different things. Uh, let's take, for example, sword. What does the sword represent? You know, whenever I ask what sword represents, they say, well, the sword represents the Word of God. And that's true. Ephesians 6.17 says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. However, there's another meaning to the sword. Now go with me to Revelation 13. I want, I want to illustrate how important it is for us to realize that symbols are flexible. Revelation 13 and verses 9 and 10. 13 verses 9 and 10. Uh, this is speaking about the deadly wound that is given to the beast that rises from the, from the sea. Uh, this beast in Revelation 13 verse 1 says that it rises from the sea. And of course we know that it's a symbol of the Roman Catholic papacy. Now verse 9 says, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. So who is that that killed with the sword? Who had the sword and killed with the sword? It was the papacy. And you say, how do you know that? Well, verse 14 says so. Speaking about the beast that rises from the earth, it says, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So who was wounded by the sword? The beast. So who used the sword to kill? The beast. And the same sword that the beast used to kill was the sword that gave him the deadly wound. Now what does that sword represent? See, it cannot represent the Bible. Because, because really, the papacy did not use the Bible to kill people. So immediately you'll see that the, the, the sword as the Bible doesn't fit there. You know, it's a different container, so to speak. So you say, now if, if the sword there does not represent the Word of God, because the papacy did not use the sword to kill God's people, didn't use the Bible to kill God's people, then what could it mean? Well, you look in other contexts to see if the symbol can mean something different. And let's go to Romans chapter 13, and you'll see that there's another meaning to the sword. Romans chapter 13, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. 13 verses 1 through 4. It says there, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now notice verse 3, for rulers, who are the rulers? The political leaders, right? For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he, that is the civil ruler, is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Does a civil ruler have a sword? Do you know what the sword of the civil ruler is? It is used to punish violations of civil law. Can the civil power punish violations of religious law? For example, if people, if, if people uh, don't worship on Sunday, but they worship on the Sabbath, does the civil power have to say, well, you've got to worship on Sunday, you can't worship on Sabbath? Of course not. Because the sword, the sword of the civil power can only be used to punish violations of civil law, not religious law. It cannot legislate the first table of the law, it can only legislate the second table, which protects relationships between human beings in society. So that the state has its sword, which is the right to punish violations of civil law, and the church has its sword, which is the Word of God, the Bible. Now how does the church use the sword? By preaching. 
You read Hebrews 4 verses 12 and 13, it says that the sword, that, that the Word of God is like a sword, it, a double-edged sword, and it penetrates into the innermost depths of the human heart. And that happens when we preach. The Word goes through the ears, and it goes all the way, and it pierces the heart. So the church has its sword, which is the Word of God. The civil power has also its sword, which it uses to punish violations of civil law. So when we find the word sword, does it always represent the same thing? No. It can take on a different shape depending on the context in which it appears. Yesterday I mentioned the expression sons of God. You know in uh, Genesis chapter 6 it says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And so theologians, um, many, many theologians, uh, not Adventists, but non-Adventist ones, they say that the sons of God in Genesis 6 were actually angels. And the reason they say that is because in the book of Job, it says that when God created this world, uh, the, the sons of God shouted for joy and sang. And obviously, uh, human beings were not around at that time. And so, uh, the, the sons of God who shouted and sang for joy when God created this world, obviously represents what? Angels. So what they do is they take Job, you know where it says the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and then chapter 38 verse 7 where it says that they sang at creation, and they say, see, sons of God here means angels, so in Genesis 6 it means angels. Big mistake. Because symbols are flexible. Symbols are liquid. And they have to be taken within their context. What is the context of sons of God in Genesis 6? The context is clear. Right before it says the sons of God came into the daughters of men, it gives the genealogy of Cain. And there are three women in the genealogy of Cain. Those are the daughters of men, by the way. And then you have the genealogy of Seth. Those are the righteous. And then in 6.1, sons of God and daughters of men. The context indicates that the sons of God are those from the holy line. From the holy line that would eventually lead to the Messiah. Are you following me or not? Uh, furthermore, in scripture, uh, God's people are called sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given us that we should be called what? The sons of God. So converted people are sons of God as well. So the holy line were people that were converted. They were the righteous and they're called sons of God. So my point is that whenever we find symbols, let's not assume that that symbol means the same thing everywhere. Because symbols are liquid, or symbols can take different shapes depending on the context in which they appear. Now the next point is very important at the bottom of page 28. It is important not to isolate a symbol from its context. Do not lose sight of the forest for the trees. Remember that each individual symbol is only one piece of the puzzle and not the puzzle in its entirety. Once you have discovered the meaning of each individual symbol, then you can put them together to get a complete picture of what God wants to teach. Uh, an illustration of this that, that we used at the very beginning of this class was the rock episode. We have three symbols in that story of the rock. We have a rock, we have a rod, and we have water. So what do you do? You, you want to look at the total picture, but in order to get the total picture, what do you have to do? You have to interpret, well, what does the rock mean? And then you say, now wait a minute, what does the rod mean? And so you look at the meaning of the rod. Then you say, well, what does the water represent? So you look at the water. And then once you've interpreted each individual symbol, you put them together to get the complete picture. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So in other words, it's, it's no good just to interpret individual symbols. The purpose of interpreting different symbols is then to put them together in a tapestry so we see the whole picture. Don't get all caught up in the trees, in the individual tree. You know, look at the forest. Look at what God wants to teach through a combination of all of the symbols and not only individual symbols. And so it's very important for us not to isolate a symbol from its context. The purpose of studying each individual symbol is 
to then get the complete picture. I like to consider symbols, like the, there's lots of symbolism in uh, Revelation chapter 11. Tremendous symbolism there. Now, I like to, to uh, compare that symbolism with the parts of a, a painting, an oil painting. See, uh, uh, an oil painting has individual parts, right? But, but the, the genius of the painting is not all the individual parts. It's taking all the individual parts and putting them there so that you can see the whole picture. See, the purpose of the parts is to see the picture. And so the purpose of interpreting individual symbols is to then be able to fit them together. And don't try to force a piece of the puzzle into the puzzle. Make sure that you interpret the symbol correctly and then every piece of the puzzle will fit together. Now the next point at the top of page 29, look for the main characteristics of the symbol and then apply it. The symbol and what is symbolized are not identical in all respects. You know, some people take the symbol and they try to apply every detail of the symbol to what it symbolizes. For example, without the intention of being sacrilegious, remember the fact that Jesus is described as a lamb that does not mean that he's woolly and he has four legs. Don't try to interpret what each leg represents when it comes to Christ. No, no, no. There's, certain, there's a certain characteristic of the symbol that is to be applied. Not every single detail of the symbol applies to what it symbolizes. Are you with me? Very, very important. Next point. Do not give contemporary meanings to prophetic symbols. Today, red is the color of communism. If you don't believe that, just look at Venezuela. You know, whenever they have rallies, it looks like there's blood in the streets. Everybody has a red shirt, and they have a red cap, and they have, uh, surprising that they don't have red pants, too. Everything is red. See, red, they say, is the color of communism. So when you find in prophecy red, that means communism. No, you can't transpose contemporary meanings back into the Bible. A bear of Daniel 7. You know, does that mean that the bear represents Russia? Because, the, because Russia has a bear on its flag? Of course not. A lion. A lion is the symbol of England. So in Daniel 7, the lion is England, right? Of course not. You know, Babylon in Revelation. Is that talking about the, the literal city of Babylon? Of course not. And so what we cannot do is take contemporary meanings of symbols and then apply them uh, to Scripture and say that's what they mean in the Bible. We have to allow the Bible to interpret its own symbols and tell us what those symbols mean. Now, for the next few minutes, I want us to take a look at uh, several categories of symbols. The first category is that persons are symbolic. I've, I've made a long list here of different types of symbols uh, to kind of help us along in interpreting these symbols. First of all, in prophecy, persons are symbolic. For example, a woman. We've studied what a woman represents. A woman represents the church. A pure woman represents a pure church. And you have several texts there. A harlot woman still represents a church, but it is an apostate church. It is a church that has gone astray from the Lord. Balaam. You know, you find in the book of Revelation, Balaam, Revelation 2 and verse 14, in relationship to the church of Pergamum. Interesting. What stage of church history is represented by Pergamum? Well, Ephesus is the apostolic church, right? Then you have Smyrna. That's the church that is persecuted by the Roman emperors. Nothing bad is said about Smyrna. You know, God has some things against every church. But uh, except for Smyrna and Philadelphia, He says nothing bad about Smyrna. Smyrna is the persecuted church by the Roman emperors. But then you have Pergamum. Pergamum is the church where apostasy enters the church in the days of Constantine. In other words, the devil is saying, if I can't, if I can't kill him, 
That's what he does under the previous church, Smyrna. He says, if I can't slay all the martyrs with the Roman, through the Roman emperors, then I've got to use a different method. He says, what I'll do is I'll infiltrate them. So you have the same method he used back in Genesis. If I can't kill the seed, let me just mix the two seeds. And you find that constantly throughout Scripture. And so, and so Balaam is mentioned in the context of that church. So why is Balaam mentioned there in the context of the church of Pergamum? That's where Satan's throne is, by the way. It's mentioned there in Revelation. The reason is very simple. Did Balaam attempt to curse Israel from outside? Yes, he did. Was he successful? No. So what did he do? He introduced apostasy into Israel by getting them to commit fornication and adultery, and then they fail. See, so the whole story of Balaam illustrates what happened during the church of Pergamum. That's why Balaam is mentioned. You know, we can also mention Jezebel. Jezebel is mentioned in the context of the church of Thyatira. And you have a whole handout on the church uh, that existed in the Middle Ages. It is the Elijah, the ecclesiastical Elijah is what I call it. Because you have all kinds of Elijah symbolism connected with the church, uh, with the fourth church of Revelation. Beginning with the fact that Jezebel is mentioned. And then if you go to Revelation 11, it says that, that the two witnesses, during the time that they're prophesying, which is the Bible, it says that there is no rain. And there is no rain for three and a half years. Does that start ringing a bell when it comes to Elijah? And so what is Revelation uh, saying when it uses Jezebel in the fourth church? It's saying, hey folks, you need to go back and you need to study the whole story. Because that whole story in the Old Testament is a symbol of, of what happened during that stage of the church. Is that making sense? And so persons in the Bible are symbolic. Is Elijah symbolic? Of course Elijah is symbolic. There are four Elijahs. Actually there's three, but the last Elijah has two stages. Let me explain. The first Elijah is the historical Elijah. If you want to understand the succeeding Elijahs, you have to thoroughly know the story of the first Elijah because that is the historical root. In other words, the basis or foundation for your interpretation of the Elijah that's, Elijahs that come afterwards are based on understanding the historical Elijah because that is your foundational prophecy. And then when you know that story, you're able to discern the fulfillment of that in succeeding uh, in succeeding passages of Scripture. And so you study the, the story of Old Testament Elijah, and basically you have, first of all, uh, a king. What kind of a king is he? A wimp. The Bible says that Jezebel just manipulated him and did whatever she wanted with him. A wimpish king. You have a harlot woman. Jezebel. She was also a witch. Yeah, it says in 2 Kings 9, verse 22, that she practiced the occult. Interesting, because Revelation says that the harlot also, the harlot called Babylon also is involved in witchcraft, or sorcery is the word that is used there. And so you have a harlot woman. And then you have the prophets of Baal who are the instruments of the woman. Because they eat at Jezebel's table, and you don't bite the hand that feeds you, as they say. And so, and so who is manipulating this whole story? Who is the dangerous figure in this whole story? Jezebel's the dangerous figure. She, she pulls all the strings. You see, she wants to kill Elijah, so she manipulates the king, and she manipulates the prophets of Baal. And by the way, she wants everyone to worship Baal, the sun god. But there's this fly in the ointment who is Elijah. By the way, in the Old Testament, Elijah is a person. The New Testament, Elijah, or what I call the prophetic Elijah, is a person. But after Jesus dies on the cross, Elijah becomes a movement. There you have our principle. See, things are literal until the Jewish nation passes as God's literal people. Then you have, during the Middle Ages, it's not one person, 
it is like the Walden sees it and the, and, and the Alvigen sees. Elijah becomes not one person, but it becomes a movement of people. And at the end of time, Elijah will be a worldwide movement, not one individual. Are you understanding me? And so you look at the story in the Old Testament, and you find the protagonist, you know, and Elijah has to flee, he's blamed for the calamities, and you look at the end of Jezebel, and you look at the end of Ahab, and all of this becomes then typological of the Elijahs that come afterwards. And so then you come to the New Testament Elijah. In three texts, Jesus says that the New Testament Elijah is John the Baptist. And so he says, wait a minute, John the Baptist is Elijah. Now, does Elijah ever appear by himself? No. If Elijah appears, his enemies appear with him. And so, he, so John the Baptist has to have three enemies, and the story has to develop in a similar way to the historical Elijah. And in Mark 6, you have this, the fulfillment of the story with New Testament Elijah. Is there a wimpy king? Yes. Herod, he's a wimpy king, isn't he? Easily, easily manipulated. He has no backbone. Then you have an adulterous woman, Herodias. And Herodias has an instrument that she uses, just like the prophets in the Old Testament was the prophets of Baal. In the New Testament, it's the daughter Salome. Now who's pulling all the strings here? Herodias the harlot. See the repetition of the story? And so she wants the death of John the Baptist, but she has no power over the king. Does the papacy have any power over the kings right now? No, because she has a deadly wound. So what, does the, so what needs to happen for, for the harlot to be able to kill John the Baptist? She has to use her daughter. She has to use her daughter to get at the kings. Is that true of the end time? Yes. See, the, the papacy has a deadly wound. The relationship between the harlot and the kings of the earth has been severed. But the harlot will use her daughters to influence the kings to eliminate God's people. Are you with me? And so the, the historical Elijah becomes the foundation to understand the New Testament Elijah, to understand the ecclesiastical Elijah, and to understand the, the broadest fulfillment of the prophecy, the end time global worldwide Elijah. Does the end time Elijah also have three enemies? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And do you know what's interesting? It doesn't say a false prophet, it says the false prophet. And he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. He is a counterfeit Elijah. Which means that if the devil feels that he has to bring in a counterfeit Elijah, it is because there is a genuine Elijah. Are you with me? And so, and so when you find Elijah and you find Jezebel in the fourth church, don't just say, oh well, that was a nasty woman in that church. No. You have to go back and you have to study the full Old Testament story. And then you have to look for a fulfillment in the New Testament. You have to look for a fulfillment during, during the ecclesiastical period. You have to look for the fulfillment in the end time. Because Jesus said that he's going to send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So Jesus himself uh, through Malachi says, listen, there is going to be an Elijah that is going to prepare my way for the second coming. So when we find a name of a person, we need to pay attention. Because those persons are symbolic. Those persons are typological. Now in prophecy, names are also symbolic. When you find a name, pay attention to the name, because the name has symbolic value. Uh, in, you see, today we use names because we, we say, yeah, for example, when we called our daughter Jennifer, that's a name that I've always liked. I, so we, we named our daughter Jennifer. Probably not a very good reason to, to give her that name, you know? Uh, my wife named my son, so I figured I had the right to name my daughter. <laughs> and my, my wife named my son Stephen Paul, just like me. Have mercy, two of them. 
But names are symbolic in the Bible, they're important. It's not like today that we give a name just to distinguish one person from another. No, 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 no. In the Bible, names help us interpret the meaning of a passage that we're studying. Let me read you two statements, first of all, from uh, the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible on the importance of names. This is volume 3, pages 500 and 501. In biblical thought, a name is not a mere label of identification. It is an expression of the essential nature of its bearer. A man's name reveals his character. This is in biblical times. Adam was able to give names to the beasts and birds because, as Milton says, he understood their nature. In the next statement, which is found uh, in volume 3, page 502, it says, To speak or act in someone's name is to act as the representative of that person and hence to participate in his authority. Which means that if you do something in the name of Jesus, you are participating in his authority because you are using his name. Similarly, to be called by a person's name implies ownership by the person. Whatever is so called comes under the authority and the protection of the one whose name is called upon it. That which is called by Yahweh's name, that is Jehovah, is his possession and therefore comes under both his authority and his protection. Now let's take a look at some biblical names. This is only a, a short list of examples about the importance of a name. How about the names of the seven churches in Revelation? Are they symbolic? Yes, they are. Do you know what Ephesus means? Desirable. <laughs> Desirable. Would anybody desire to belong to the apostolic church? Absolutely. What does Smyrna mean? It means bittersweet myrrh. Do you know what myrrh was used for? To embalm the dead. In the church of Smyrna, if you read the message, it has all kinds of death language. Because this is the period when the church is being slaughtered by the Roman emperors. Pergamum means acropolis or height. And of course the church at this time was favored by the empire. And after the valley of persecution, it was at the heights. Laodicea means judging the people. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Is that true of the Millerites? Brotherly love, yeah. So the names of the churches help us understand the nature of the church during that period. The word, the name Nimrod. Ever heard of Nimrod? Who was he? He was the builder of Babylon. In Genesis 11, do you know what his name means? Rebellion. Did he fit the name? Oh, you better believe it. What does Babylon mean? Confusion. What does Eve mean? Mother of all the living. Does that name fit her? Is that a descriptive name? Adam didn't just say, oh, let's see what name. Oh, Eve, that's so pretty. No. There's a purpose in giving the name. What does Lucifer mean? Light bearer. That means that his light was not his own. His light was reflected light. Sarai means what? Laughter. Why would she be called laughter? Because when God said that she was going to have a child, she laughed. <laughs> she had a sense of humor. <laughs> Daniel means God is my judge. Does that fit the book of Daniel very well? Oh yes. A lot of talk about the judgment. Esau means red. Interesting. When he was born, he was all red. <laughs> That's why, you know, he had red hair. So he's called red. And he sold his birthright for a bunch of red lentils. <laughs> and there's many more other examples of red things that are associated with Esau. Michael, who is like God? It is a challenge. And that's why most of the time when Jesus is called Michael in the Bible, he's in, in a struggle with the devil. So when Michael comes, it's a challenge that, where Jesus says, Who is like God? 
every time that he faces the devil. His name is significant. Methuselah comes from two Hebrew words, Mut and Shalach. And when you combine those two words, it means when he dies, it will be sent. What a strange name to call a son. When he dies, it will be sent. Why would he have this name? It's very simple. Methuselah died the year of the flood. And I'm not going to take the time now to prove that. Do you know that Jewish tradition says that Methuselah died 10 days before the flood? We can't prove biblically that it was 10 days before the flood, but we can prove that he died the year of the flood. So his name, the name that was given to him by Enoch was a prophetic name. It was an announcement of when the flood was going to come. When he dies, it will be sent. So are names important? Yes. What does the word Satan mean? Accuser. Does that fit him well? Oh, yes. What does the word devil mean? Diabolos. It means slanderer. Was he a slanderer? Oh, yeah. Is he a slanderer? Yes. Elijah means my God is Yahweh. My God is the Lord. Not Baal. <laughs> Yahweh. Enoch means dedicated. Was Enoch dedicated to the Lord? Yes. Most certainly was. Ezra means help. This is interesting. Ezra means help. What does Ezra help to do? Ezra and Nehemiah both helped to rebuild Jerusalem. Lazarus, oh, excuse me, Nabal means fool. In fact, his wife said, that, you know, he's rightly named. <laughs> fool. What does Lazarus mean? It means may God help. Why is that significant? Because he certainly was not helped by the rich man. <laughs> so may God help me. In other words, it is what it means. Israel means prince of God. And of course you know that Jacob before that means supplanter. So he was changed from a supplanter to a prince of God. And his name was changed, of course, when he had his struggle with the angel. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Solomon means peace giver. Uh, here we have a New Testament, Boanerges, sons of thunder. It expressed well, they, were, they had a hot temper, James and John. Moses means one drawn out. Why would he be called one drawn out? Because he was drawn out of the waters. Beth, now here's an interesting combination. Bethlehem means house of bread. Where was Jesus born? In the house of bread. Where did he grow up? And that means to sprout or to shoot up. <laughs> and he suffered in Gethsemane, which means the olive press. And he was crucified at Golgotha, the place of the skull. Interesting. Those names help us to understand the character of those places. Jordan means descender. You say, why would the river Jordan be called Jordan, descender? Because the Jordan River originates at Mount Hermon, you know, in the, near the Golan Heights. And when the, when the Jordan River begins, torrents of water come down the, the Mount Hermon, and then they come to the valley, and then the river flows down the valley into the Sea of Galilee, and then out to the Dead Sea. And so it's very appropriately named Descender. And then you have Isaiah, salvation of the Lord. Is, doesn't he describe the salvation through the Messiah? Of course. And then you have Yahweh Jireh. That's the name that, 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 uh, that we find when Abraham takes his son to offer him on Mount Moriah. He called the Mount Ma, Ma, Yahweh Jireh. That is, the Lord will provide. Why was it called the Lord will provide? Because God did provide a ram in place of His Son. And you know, it's interesting. Isaac 
is a twofold symbol. Before he's placed on the altar, he represents Christ. But only up till that point. And he also represents Christ in the fact that the third day, by the way, this is happening the third day, if you read the story, Abraham receives him back alive. And Hebrews says that it was like he resurrected from the dead. However, Isaac was not killed, so he could not be a symbol of the death of Christ. He's a symbol of the submission of Christ to the Father. He's a symbol of Christ in the sense that the third day Abraham received him alive after, the, he, after he considered him as good as dead. But Isaac was not sacrificed. That's why you needed another symbol, which was the ram. Are you following me? Now, Delilah, the consumer. <laughs> Does that fit her character very well? Oh, her love consumed poor old Samson. Emmanuel means what? God with us. Jesus means Yahweh saves or Jehovah saves. Christ, Christos, means anointed. Jacob, supplanter. We already had Israel, prince of God. Armageddon means mount of the congregation. I used to believe that it meant mount of slaughter, but really it means mount of congregation because the devil is going to come to the place where God's people are congregated. In, in, in Isaiah 14, it's Har Moed. And of course, Abaddon, or Apollyon, means destroyer. So let me ask you, is it important to understand the meaning of biblical names in order to catch the picture of what God is trying to teach? Yes. Names are symbols, as well as people being symbols. Now, numbers are also symbolic. Number four, it represents universality. How many points of the compass? Four rivers watered the whole earth. Four winds, all the world. Four beasts, four nations. Four banners in Israel represents all of the encampment. So in Revelation chapter 17, when this beast has ten horns, and you have in Revelation 17 also the number four, we'll come back to that a little bit later on, are we to pay attention to the importance of the number? Absolutely. So the number four represents universality. The number seven, what does the number seven represent? The number seven represents fullness, totality, perfection, we say. For example, how long did it take to create the world? Seven days, including the Sabbath, of course. How many times did Israel march around Jericho for it to be totally destroyed? Seven days. How many times did Naaman dip himself in the Jordan to be totally clean? How many times was the fiery furnace heated? Seven times. How many times was the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat? Seven times. How many churches represent... All of the history of the Christian church. Seven churches. How, how many plagues? The totality of God's wrath. Seven plagues. Jesus has seven horns. Horns represent power, all power. He has seven eyes. All wisdom. So is the number seven symbolic? Yes, it is. How about the number three? The number three represents the Godhead. How many persons in the Godhead? Three. And there are a lot of people that feel uncomfortable with that they, these days. You know, there's a lot of people attacking the doctrine of the Godhead. They're saying, you know, the only one who is God is the Father. Jesus is created by God. And the Holy Spirit isn't even a person. The Holy Spirit is, is a, a force. Or the Holy Spirit is an influence. I don't believe that for a minute. 
I believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three persons. Individual, distinct persons. Each one with their own individuality. They have different functions. The Son is under the authority of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is under the authority of the Son. Even in a perfect universe. You know, the reason I emphasize that is because there's this argument by those who are discussing this issue of, of the roles of men and women in the home and in the church. They say, listen, if you believe that the wife is supposed to be subject to the husband, then you're saying that the wife is inferior to the husband. False argument. Because if you argue that way, then you're going to have to say that Jesus is inferior to his father because he subjects himself to his father. Is Jesus inferior to his father? No. Whose will does the Holy Spirit do? Christ's. Is the Holy Spirit subject to the authority of Jesus? Yes, he is. So the Holy Spirit is inferior to Jesus because he's subject to Jesus. No. no. You see, subjection does not mean inferiority. Two equals can have one subject to the other and still be equal. But somehow people don't understand that. They find it difficult to understand that. But it's very clear in Scripture that even before sin, the Son was subject to the Father. There's nothing bad in that, folks. Subjection is divine. Wanting to ascend is diabolical. Jesus said the greatest is the least. He who becomes a servant is the greatest. So all this fight, I want this position, and I want, to, I want this, and I want that. That is not of God. Anyway, how did I go out, get off on that subject? <laughs> the number six represents man in apostasy against God. Particularly the number 666. Do you know the first time in the Bible where 666 appears? Solomon's yearly income was 666 talents of gold. And you know what's interesting? Immediately after the Bible says that that was his income, in the very next chapter, it speaks about the apostasy of Solomon. And it gives two reasons. Number one, his riches. And number two, fornicating with women from foreign nations. So let me ask you, in Revelation, must the number 666 have to do with a system that is very rich and a system that commits fornication and leads God's people astray? See how important the context is? It's vitally important. The number 10 means whole. So you have the 10 uh, in Revelation chapter 17. We'll get into that later. The number 40 represents tribulation and trial. How many days did Jesus spend being tempted in the wilderness? 41. 40 days. How, how many uh, days did Goliath uh, challenge Israel? 40 days. How long did Israel last in, uh, last in the desert? 40 years. So 40 in the Bible represents tribulation and trial when you find it. And I only put these as a sampling of numbers. There are other numbers in Scripture that are very, very important, but uh, you know, all you have to do is go where? To a concordance, hello. <laughs> and look up the Word. And look at all of the references to that number. And then, uh, you know, find a common denominator. And look and see if that interpretation fits the context of the passage that you are studying. Beasts are also symbolic. They are symbolic of what? Of nations, kingdoms, or empires. For example, the four beasts of Daniel 7 represent four kingdoms, right? How do you know that? You don't even have to go any other place because Daniel 7 tells you so. The symbol is interpreted in Daniel 7. The lion represents Babylon. The beast from the earth 
represents the United States. A dove represents the Holy Spirit who rules over the kingdom of grace. Now let me mention just a couple of things as we close here, this section. And by the way, the next section I want to finish this. Is this interesting? Yes. Does it help you in, in knowing how to interpret symbols? I certainly hope so. It's good to give examples because uh, when we apply the examples it becomes much more practical. Let's talk just uh, for a few moments here about this beast that rises from the earth and has two horns like a lamb. You know, traditionally we have said that horns represent kingdoms or divisions of kingdoms, right? For example, we have the ten horns on the head of the dragon beast. They represent the ten kingdoms into which the Roman Empire was divided. You say they're kingdoms, right? We have the four horns on the head of the he-goat in Daniel 8. They represent the four kingdoms that sprang from Alexander the Great's kingdom. So we say horns are kingdoms. But when we come to Revelation 13, we say that these two horns are principles. The two horns, like a lamb, of this beast that ends up speaking like a dragon. We say those two horns represent two principles. Now, on what basis can we say that horns represent kingdoms, and then we have a beast here that has two horns like a lamb, and we say that these horns represent principles. You know the closest parallel to what we find to this beast in Revelation 13 is found in Daniel 8. There is a ram that has two horns, and one is taller than the other. See that a ram is a male sheep, right? That's the closest parallel to this beast that rises from the earth, is Daniel 8, the ram. It has two horns, and one of them is higher than the other. And the highest one came out last because the Persians, uh, you know, became predominant later on. The, the Medes were only there at the very beginning, then they disappeared, and all of the rulers after that were Persians. So this, this uh, prophecy of Daniel 8 can be proved historically that it's true, that uh, the, this kingdom was composed of two kingdoms, right? What do the two horns represent? There was only one, there was only one nation, but that one nation was composed of two what? Of two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians. So if we go to Revelation 13, we ask the question, would these two horns represent two kingdoms? The answer is yes. But from the idea of two kingdoms, if you read the book on Jekyll and Hyde, from the idea of two kingdoms springs the idea of two principles. Now what do I mean? What are the two kingdoms that are recognized by the United States Constitution? The church and the state. The First Amendment protects religion. It says that Congress cannot make laws establishing religion or forbidding the free exercise of religion. So does the Constitution recognize the right of religion? Yes. Is that one kingdom? Is the church a kingdom? Yes. Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church and I will give you the keys to the kingdom. So the church is a kingdom. Is the state a kingdom? So what do we have in the United States? We have one nation that recognizes the same two kingdoms that Jesus recognized. Render therefore to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. Are you following me? In that way we are consistent in our interpretation. Because I've had people ask me, why do you say their principles here and their kingdoms elsewhere? And I answer, they are kingdoms. But from the idea of kingdom springs the idea of two principles, which is separation of the two kingdoms. Church and state, what Ellen White calls republicanism and protestantism. Republicanism has nothing to do with the Republican Party. It is a republic. 
and that means that it is a representative style of government. That's what a republic is. A republic is not a democracy. It is a representative style of government. And so in the United States, the Founding Fathers said, we recognize that there are two legitimate kingdoms in this country. One is the church, and we're going to protect the right of people to worship according to the dictates of their conscience, and the other is the state. By the way, of how many kingdoms are you citizens? <laughs> we're in one nation, but we are citizens of two kingdoms. I'm a citizen of the United States. But living in the United States, I'm also a citizen of heaven because I'm a member of the church. So I have two nationalities within the same nation. And I have two passports, my U.S. passport and the blood of the Lamb. Do we have responsibilities for the church? Yes. Do we have responsibilities for the state? Yes. What is our financial res responsibility to the state? Taxes. And what our financial responsibility to the church? Tithe. But it would be illegitimate to take God's tithe and give it to the state or take Caesar's money and give it to the church. And we've crossed that line in the Adventist church. And it's going to come back to bite us. Taking money from Caesar for the church. Because Caesar never gives without expecting in return. And Caesar's going to say, well, you took my money, so why don't you want to do what I say? That's why there needs to be a strict separation between church and state. According to prophecy, the union of church and state is, what is going to lead to the persecution of God's people. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't vote and we shouldn't support the state. Oh, of course we should, as good citizens. And we should be good church members. But we should not mix or mingle the things of the church and the th things of the state. They should remain absolutely separate, one from the other. And if we don't separate those two, the results will be dire. And we know that this is going to happen very, very soon uh, in these United States of America and in the whole world. 